ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم لا تقدموا بين يدي الله ورسوله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني So we are studying again today the subject of ahkam in hadith versus a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that has targheeb or tarheeb. Targheeb and tarheeb is the general asloob. In fact, maybe one day I will give a lecture on this. The asloob of hadith, which is the style of hadith. Like for example, if you take all the things of the Prophet, you can categorize them into give and take into about uh, 13, 14 different styles of making a point. Okay. So there are well-known classifications. Okay, for example, uh, a very well-known classification of hadith style of mentioning something is Wallahi la yu'minu ahadakum hatta yuhibu li akhihi ma yuhibu li nafsi la yu'minu ahadakum hatta hawa utaba min maji'atu So there is a certain style of that a hadith has. But as far as ihkam are concerned, like I said, generally all the ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ, they fall within targheeb and tarheeb. Targheeb means to encourage someone to a certain direction. Tarheeb means to warn him from a certain direction. Now, within this targheeb and tarheeb, this is all the sayings of the Prophet. They are either encouraging a Prophet, a person to one direction or another. Then there are those that also you can say fall into two categories over here. One is, there is a hadith with khabar. Khabar means general information. For example, Buniya Islam wa ala khamsin, Islam is built upon five things. Right? The only, you can say, uh, hukum aspect maybe in this hadith is man istata'a ilayhi sabila, this istata'a is part of the shart. Uh, for Hajj. Other than that, this whole hadith is what? It's what? Information. There's no hukum in it per se. Now, in terms of the general styles of hadith, so you have targheeb and tarheeb, and then you have either a hadith has a hukum in it, or it has khabar in it. Either it has a hukum in it, or it has a khabar in it. Today, I want to give you a little bit Now the khabar can be something about something that's... Now we will look into this in some detail inshallah today. But as far as ahkam is concerned, the Qur'an says, Atiullaha wa atiul rasul. Obey Allah and His Messenger. So the point is, how do you know that there is a hukum here? How do you know? Is when the Prophet says something in some way that you can tell that it is a command. That you can tell that it is a command. For example, just I'm giving you random examples, then I want to give you very specific examples from give you a very, maybe I'll go over 20 ahadith uh, on the topic of tahara or something like this uh, that have to do with ihkam. Then you will see, okay, this is how ihkam, ahadith that have ihkam, this is what they look like. Then we will compare that with other types of sayings of the Prophet Let me quickly categorize them. No, before that, I want to give you one example. For example, a sahabi comes to the prayer, he joins the prayer, and he says, Hamdan kathiran tayyaba mubarakan fi." And the Prophet ﷺ stands up after prayer and he says, Who said this? And the angels were coming and raising one another, who takes this? Is there some hukum in this hadith? Huh? There's no hukum per se. Right? But is there targheeb in this hadith? Maybe there's tarheeb, but for example, we can say, even though the Prophet acknowledged this, but the other Sahaba didn't do it, or the Prophet didn't adapt it necessarily. So it's, there is tarheeb in it, but there's also no hukum in it at the same time. But another faqih can disagree, depending upon how the argument goes. So in the same way, uh, the Prophet wasallam, for example, he curses something. Okay, we will go over many of the ahadiths in which the Prophet curses something. Can a hadith that has a curse in it? Allah curses the man who imitates the woman and the woman who imitates the man. Is there any hukm ashari in here? Huh? 
This is why the categorization of Imam Shafi'i is very useful, actually. Because Imam Shafi'i, he does something very simple. He says there's fard and there's sunnah. Fard as if it's fard. There's a clear hukum, a shari, it's fard. Everything else, you'll get punished in the day of judgment. If you don't have, uh, you know, if you're not following certain injunctions, that's between you and Allah on the day of judgment. But the things you have to do in dunya are fard. This is actually one very important distinction. Fard or hukum a shari has to do with the things of this dunya. What does it mean? It has to do with this dunya. It means that it is a legal issue that has to that can be taken up as a legal issue in front of the judge, in front of the court cases. If you like, for example, is there hukum a shari in this? Meaning, there's a hukum now. There can be a hukum. There are two types of hukum also, by the way. Hukum that Allah says you have to do this, but it has, it's a hukum, but it has no legal precedent. And a hukum that has a legal precedent. For example, disobeying your parents. Disobeying your parents. Or a wife, uh, you can say, completely destroying the house some way. There is no legal precedent for these two things. If if son wants to disobey his father and curse his father and be disobedient and you can't necessarily, you can't take him to the judge, there's no hud. He can do ta'zeel from himself, like some fine maybe he wants to give him or some difficulty he wants to put him in. But per se, there is no legal there is a hukum, but it doesn't have a legal, what? It doesn't have any legal precedent for it. But if someone steals, there is a legal had for it, there's a legal precedent for it. If somebody steals, he has to go to the court. So hukum is of two types. Hukum that has a legal precedent in dunya. And the second is, it's a hukam, but it doesn't have a legal precedent in dunya. It has a legal precedent in the hereafter. Like disobeying the prophets. Uh, for example, uh, I have to say, Assalamu alaikum. Right? The prophet said, there are six rights of a believer to a believer. Assalamu alaikum is one of them. I can't take you to court if you didn't say Assalamu alaikum to me. Right? I mean, the judge can maybe advise you but he's not going to really punish you for that. And that's, in, in fact, uh, in Islamic law, that's uh, what has happened. Like, for example, the court cases that we have from Muslim Spain, uh, from Spain, like uh, a wife, uh, she goes to the judge, the local masjid, and she wants a uh, divorce from her husband. Her husband doesn't want a divorce. It's actually a real case. Uh, you know, the, the judge, the local judge at the masjid is telling her, you know, uh, why don't you true try to but it's her right to want the divorce. So the judge can only pursue her only to a certain degree before he has to agree, okay, if you want the divorce, you have to. It's your right. So certain things, so hukam is of two types. Hukam that has a legal effectiveness here. And you can take the person to court for that. The other is a hukam for which Allah will ask you about on the day of judgment. So when it is a curse, when the Prophet of Allah is cursing something, it generally, it falls, it can fall in both, depending upon how the wordings are. But generally, when the Prophet of Allah curses something, he's talking about the hereafter. He's talking about the, word, the hereafter. There's no legal precedent. In other words, uh, you can say that if a male dresses like a female, or a female dresses like a male, you can, there's nothing to do with taking them to court. Right? That's between that person and Allah on the of Day of Judgment. He's sinful. He's sinful. So Imam Shafi'i, he would say he's sinful. He's sinful. He, and it's not a... Uh, you know, so, uh, anyhow. So, so, for example, the Prophet wasallam. so he said, uh, Allah curses the male who acts like the female, the female who acts like the male. Now, for example, al-ilmu fariratan ala kulli muslim. What is this hadith? Is it hukum in it? Knowledge is a faridah upon every muslim. 
Is there a hukum in it? How do you know there's a hukum in it? There's a word for that stuff. Okay. First is, uh, it's a command. But can you take someone to court for this? No. So then what, it, 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 where does it fall? It falls in the hereafter. It's between you and your Lord. So. There's no legal precedent here. There's no legal precedent here. Here, in, in meaning that if, if I don't go acknowledge, you cannot take me to court. See, this hadith can fall both sides. Because I'm going a little bit further. In fact, from this hadith itself, it is not a hukam per se. But we know ilm of sharia is a fart, uh, it's a shart. Knowledge of the ahkam is a shart to do the ahkam. Right? So you see what I'm trying to say? The knowledge of, you can't do the ahkam if you don't know the ahkam. So in that sense, ilm is shart. For every hukam of Allah, it's a shart. You have to know it. So, okay. Then, for example, the Prophet ﷺ says, let the beard grow. It's a command. Let the beard grow. Now, is beard far? Sunnah. Sunnah. But, it's a, but the Prophet said it in a command. So a command by the Prophet, a command by the Prophet is a hukam, but it is not far. It is a hukam, meaning it can be not doing it could be makruh, or it could be an encouragement from Allah, uh, from Allah or His Messenger. It can be an encouragement, but when there is a a command from the Prophet, it is not like a command in the Quran. It would basically disobeying the Prophet, Atiullah, Atiur Rasul, would mostly, not in all cases. I will show you the exceptions today if I get time. Mostly fall under makruh. Have we done that as Well, okay. So you have the fard, which is, and the wajib, which is the Hanafi term. Because Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Ahmed bin Hanbal, they don't use the word fard. Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, they only use the word wajib and sunnah. And, and sunnah mu'akkada. But Abu Hanifa, he uses the word fard, wajib, sunnah mu'akkada, sunnah. So... Three of them, they don't use the word fard. Now the difference between fard and wajib, this is a, a later discussion that I'll have. But the point being that there is hukum that is effective here and there's hukum that is effective there. Hukum by the Prophet ﷺ, disobeying the Messenger of Allah, generally speaking, does not fall into haram. Disobeying the Messenger of Allah does not fall into haram. It falls into makruh. Disobeying Allah falls into haram. Disobeying the Messenger of Allah falls into makruh. This is why you cannot shortchange the idea of makruh. Sometimes we say, oh, it's just makruh. No. It's not just makruh. It's, it's disobeying the Messenger of Allah. This is how you should see it. So, so I was saying, so one way, so there are a few points I've made so far because some people just came in so, so that they're also clear. There's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that has a, what? Curse in it. It is between you and him on the, it is not, has no legal effective clause in it. Now another way to know that there's a hadith with a hukam in it. Hadith with a hukum in it, you know it's a hukum when the Prophet ﷺ defines categories. For example, the hadith about riba. The one who gives the riba, the one who writes the riba, the one who records it, the one who takes it, the hukum for all of them is the same. So when there's a hadith that's giving categorizations, then the categorization is an Arabic style of clarifying this is law, it's legal. It has the same consequences from beginning to end. In the same way, the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ about khamar, alcohol, the one who, who uh, grows it, the one who uh, you know, t takes it out, and the one who delivers it, and the one who drinks it, the hukum for all of them is the same. A lot of times the hadith that have hukum in them, 
Okay, the hadith that have hukum in them, one of the qualities that they have is they will use specific words. For example, innama. Innama is hasr, making it specific. Innama al-a'malu bin niyat. For example, Imam Shafi'i in his, in his fiqah, niyat is important, super important. He's the one out of the four. The imam who uses niyat in almost everything is Imam Shafi'i. He makes, for example, for sawm, for fasting. Most of the fuqaha, well actually it's two and two in the case of sawm, but like Imam Malik and Imam Shafi, they are agreeing upon this issue. But Imam Shafi, for everything niyat is important. Because of this hadith, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ إِنَّمَا Whether it is in Qur'an or in hadith, make it a hukam. In the same way, anytime the Prophet says لا, a companion of the Prophet asks the Prophet a question, and he says لا, لا becomes a hukam. Okay? Or a hadith of the Prophet wasallam starting with لا. لا صلاة إلا بفاتحة. There's no salah without fatiha. In the same way, the word إِذَا, إِذَا when something, something happens. So the, these are the ways to know this is hadith. This hadith is not khabar, but it is, it has a hukam. And there is two types of hukam. Hukam of, that has a court application, Islamic court, application in the Islamic court. It is effective in the Islamic court. Or it is between you and Allah on the day of judgment. Okay. The other way, hadith, or the ahadiths have effectiveness as a hukum is, and I'll give you three examples of this. Something, because the Prophet is allowed to make ijtihad. There's something very important. The Prophet of Allah makes ijtihad. Everything of the Prophet is to do his ijtihad. And if the Prophet makes a mistake in his ijtihad, Allah corrects him. And the highest ijtihad, the highest level of ijtihad of a, of a Rasul of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to make the ijtihad to adapt something from a previous sharia. Something that was hukum in the previous sharia and he adapts it into his own sharia. For example, I'll give you three examples. For example, the issue of uh, the murtad. Now this is, I, ha I have more details about it, but I'm giving you the general principle. In, this is not an individual issue, this is more like a rebellion at the collective level. But the issue of the murtad is, like for example, Musa, at the time of Musa والسلام, they took the calf for worship, and Allah says, فَاخْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ So kill yourselves because you have done shirk. So the same way, this has been adopted into the sharia of Muhammad This is the ijtihad of Rasulullah. There's no ayah that says in the Qur'an, because a fard comes from, a hukam in had comes from where? A had comes only from Qur'an. A had comes only from Qur'an, generally speaking. And if some had has been mentioned in Qur'an regarding the previous people, then the Rasul has the, has the ability to do the ijtihad, to take that previous hukam of that previous sharia to his own ummah. One example is Raja. The other example is homosexual, the, the, the penalty for the homosexual. The other example is magic. It doesn't say in the Quran, kill the person who does magic. It doesn't say that. Where does it become hukam? Raja is not in Quran that stoned the, per, the adulterer to death. It's not in Quran. But it was in the previous sharias as mentioned in Quran. Quran mentions it as something of the previous, in the same way uh, uh, the people that do magic. There's no had for it, but it mentions it in the, in the sense of Bani Israel. So, there are some things of the previous sharia. This aspect that sharia of Muhammad and sharia of the past are different, this is actually an incorrect concept. Essentially, the hukum of Allah is the hukum of Allah. Whether it was previous or past. And the aqidah is the same also. There, is more, there are changes, but the basic deen, the basic principles are all the same. More has been added, not necessarily taken away that much. Anyway, this is another uh, thing. So, previous sharia, the Prophet can do ijtihad to adapt something that was a hukam in the previous sharia. This is why when Allah says, كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ السِّيَابِ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ So it is making it 
mandatory one by Kutiba alaykum. It is ordained for you. And not only that, this was also ordained for the people before. Meaning something that has been ordained for the people before can be adopted here. Okay? So, this is the... Why am I going through this? Because a lot of times when we mention hadith, we, get, can, we have to make a distinction between a hadith that has targheeb and tarheeb, a general encouragement or a general discouragement. Like for example, the Prophet of Allah says, Allah curses such and such person. This doesn't have hukum in it necessarily. You have to know which ahadith, like I said, out of the whole collection of hadith, there's only 1,200 hadith give and take that have what? Hukum in it. So you have to be able to define, okay, this hadith has hukum in it. So we are going to go over many ahadith today, but let me give you also anything that the Qur'an mentions, for example, salah, I'm giving you the general rules right now, anything the Qur'an mentions, alcohol, salah, zina, bearing false witness, being fasad in the world, so on and so forth, all of these things that have been mentioned in the Qur'an and then the details of it are given by the Prophet of Allah, they also become hukam ash-shari. Now, for example, now, take these two examples. The Prophet says, Sallu kama ra'aythumuni asalli. Pray as you see me pray. Now, is this a hukum? Are you telling the people pray? Praying is a, is a command in salah. And the Prophet saying, pray as you see me. Pray. But now this prayer that the Prophet does, does it not get divided into what is fard and what is sunnah? Tell me. There are some aspects of this prayer that are fard. There's some aspects of the same prayer that are sunnah. So, usalli kama ra'aytumuni usalli, pray as you see me pray. One hadith doesn't give the whole story. Right? But it is a hukam. Hukam is, you have to do it the way the Prophet did it. Right? You have to do it. And over here, by the way, this hadith is very important because it is an amal of the Prophet ﷺ versus a statement of the Prophet ﷺ. We're going to go into some of these aspects a little bit later. So, <clears throat> So when there's a hadith that gives categories, or when there's a hadith that specifically says, this is haram upon my ummah, or a specific hadith where the Prophet, this is halal for my ummah, even though it's haram in the Quran. For example, we will go over one example. So now I want, after mentioning these basic things, I want to now go over some examples. Now one example I gave is, there's a hukum already in Quran, further explained by the Prophet. This is specifically important in the mazahibs of Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, and Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal. This method. There's a hukum in Quran, and then there's an explanation by the Prophet wasallam by his actions or by his words. The second category, now I'm going to go over 20 ahadith of ihkam to give you an idea of how hadith ihkam are, and then I'm going to give you some other ahadith which you will tell me if they are hukam in it or not. Okay, so these are ahadith of ihkam. This is how they sound. Also, uh, very important is when a hadith of ihkam is mentioned, Generally, you will find the Prophet ﷺ explain, it is as if he's explaining one of, or he uses or explains one of the Quranic terms. Okay, so for example, very, uh, one of the famous, I'm going to go over the chapter of Kitab uh, 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 the, 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 the chapter of water, Mia. Uh, so, the Prophet ﷺ says, and because just to make it short, I'm going to do these in very quickly, okay? So you get, he's referring to the water, the bahar, the oceans. The water is pure and halal are its dead. So you see, how do you know this is hadith has a hukam in it? How do you know this hadith has hukam in it? Because it's saying it's dead or halal. And its water is pure. And tuhur is one of the Quranic terms. Okay? In the same way, the Prophet says, Water, inna, see, inna, inna, this is what taqeed, right? 
the water is pure, nothing makes it najis, physically impure, najis. Do you see this is a hukam? Clear explanation of something. Clear explanation of a hukam. Versus, for example, the Prophet cursing someone. Whoever does this and this, he's cursed. There's no hukam in that per se. Right? There's no clear hukam in that. It's it-targheeb. It is an encouragement. It is targheeb. It is a discouragement from doing something. So in the same way, the Prophet ﷺ says, the Prophet says, الماء تحور Water is pure إلا إلا Now again, this is a harf or shart which it has to do with hukum. He's saying something is this except this. So you see now he is giving you details, right? He's giving you الماء تحور إلا أن يتغير بريه أو تمعه ولونه So except if it is changed by the wind, by the by the by its smell or by its taste or by its color, then it's not pure. So here the Prophet is giving you categories, right? He's saying something is pure unless this this. So there's clear hukum, there's a hukum in this, right? Okay. Ida is one of those words. Okay, so the next hadith. When something is qiltain, qiltain was, you can say, 115 kilograms of water. The fuqaha, none of them agree upon how much is qiltain, or it is basically skins of water, basically. Uh, so there is a certain amount of water, which is not agreed upon. Uh, if you have that much water and it is running, then it is, doesn't get impure. Running water, generally the rule is running water, it doesn't get impure. In the same way, the Prophet ﷺ So the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, None of you should take a bath in water that is st sitting there, stand, stagnant, stagnant. Is there a hukum in this? La. Right? La. No. Okay, so in the same way, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Naha Rasulullah. What does it mean? He forbade, the Prophet forbade, rajuli that a man should uh, do ghusl with the water left over by the man. And, oh, rajulu bi fadlil mar'i, or a, uh, uh, a man should do ghusl with the water left over in the, in the bucket with, uh, uh, from his wife, even though there's another hadith with Umm Salma, for example, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Umm Salma, this is also in Sahih Bukhari and other places, where the Prophet did ghusl with his wife, right? So, uh, so anyway, so these, what the Prophet did, like the Prophet took ghusl with his wife, this becomes a hukum, because everything the Prophet did is within the hukum of shar'i. Okay? But his sayings, when the Prophet says something, you have to prove that this is within hukum. When the Prophet does something, I have to also clarify this, not just anything. You have to prove that what the Prophet did is within the ahkam al shari This is a condition also. You can't, not just anything he does. But within ahkam al shari then that becomes a detailed hukum of it, whether it is fard or sunnah or sunnah mu'aqida, then it is an explanation of the sharia. Okay, in the same way, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, "At-tuhur ina ina i ahadakum ida walaqa fihi kalbu an yaktasalhu sab'a marat." When a dog licks uh, the dish, uh, you have to clean it seven times with water and then one time with dust. So, in the same way, innaha laysat bin najas. The Prophet is talking about the cat. It is not najas. So here is in Naha there's a there's like a command here. In Naha Tawafina alaykum, but the cats they just go around with you. In the same way the Prophet said, uh this is the hadith that's very well known, Jaha Rabia Fabala fi Ta'ifatim Masjid. There's a man, he is a Bedouin, he comes and he urinates in part of the masjid. Uh, and the people were angry against him so the Prophet stopped them when he finished his urination 
uh, so you know the Prophet said just put water wherever he uh, did urination. So again, this is there's an event that takes place, something happened, it became najas, the Prophet said do this. This explains hukam ashari. Something like this. This you have to get the taste of it. It's 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 very hard to define which uh, you know as a science even it, it it has a certain art to it because it's about knowing the language and it's about being able to define okay there's a hukum here there's a there's a there's a hukum a shar'i here and uh, you know sometimes when something is explained in terms of shart do this in this condition do this if this happens if something becomes not just do this then you know that there is a hukum a shar'i in that also. Uh, in the same way, ma qutiya min al-bahima, whatever is cut, meaning the leg of a cattle or his, some part of his body is cut, ma qutiya min al-bahima ti wahiya hayyatun, and even though it is alive, that part that is cut, fa huwa mayit, that part that is cut is treated as what? It's dead. Okay. So in the same way, the Prophet said, la tashrabu. Do not drink from the uh, vessel that is made of gold. So there's a clear hukam. Don't do this. So you get this idea of now from the ahadith that have hukam in it. In the same way, let me just quickly go over just a few of these and then we will look at the other ahadith in which the Prophet is maybe cursing someone. The Prophet is uh, doing targhib and targhib in other ways and you'll be able to see the difference. Uh, uh, in the same way the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said إِذَا دُبْغَ إِحَابُ فَقَدْ تَحَرْ When you take the skin of any animal and tan it, it becomes tahur. Again, this word tahara that comes from Qur'an, it attaches itself to Qur'an and therefore becomes a hukum. And again, uh, Iza, remember I said Iza, when the word Iza or Innama, these are used, these are again to use, to show the word, to show the idea of Hukam. Uh, uh, so here the Prophet is saying the tanning of the dead skin of the dead animal is purification of it. And in the same way the Prophet وسلم, Ya Rasulullah, in uh, he, a companion of the Prophet says, "A قوم أهل الكتاب فأكل من آنيتهم." There are people of the book. Should we eat from their foods? The Prophet says, "لا." لا means what? It's hukum, right? لا تأكل فيها إلا أن لا تجد غيرها. Don't eat from their utensils, except if you don't find any other utensils, then you can eat from their utensils. In the same way, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. It has been uh, said, "Anna Nabiyyu sallallahu alaihi wasallam al-sahabahu tatawadda'u min mazadat thil mar'ati mushrika." The the Prophet and his companions did it wudu from the uh, the the vessel, the the skin, uh, animal skin vessel. Uh, uh, they did wudu from the female. It belonged to a female who was a mushrika, and they did wudu with that water because the water is tahur, right? So uh, so. Even though she was mushrika, this is muttafaqun alayhi. In the same way, in in kasara, uh, an an qadha nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam in kasara. This is very interesting. Now the prophet had a cup. The cup cracked. Okay. So what does he do? فَأَخَذَتْ مَكَانُ الشِّعْبِ السِّلْسَلَةِ مِنَ الْفِضَّةِ. So the prophet took a silver wire and. Uh, sealed the, you know, put a, a wire around his cup so it would stay. Uh, so even though uh, gold and silver is not allowed, as we just read, but here the Prophet just takes a silver wire around his cup to uh, to fix it and to drink from it. There's many ahkam you can take out from this that if something is of small amount, even if it is not allowed, even, even though it's haram, it's allowed. And here's a fi'l of the Prophet. He's doing something, right? He's doing something that has to do with hukum ash shari right? Uh, so he's taking a small wire and putting it around. In the same way, this is my maybe last hadith. Uh, uh, he was asked about taking alcohol, vinegar out of alcohol, and he said no. Okay, so here are... 
making vinegar out of alcohol. So can you take alcohol and make vinegar out of it? He said no. Okay. So uh, so this should be enough for this uh, point. You got some idea of what a hadith that has a hukum in it looks like. Now, this will be more clear when the contrast is made. So now I'm going to go over some of the ahadith that are general. And we'll go over many of them. But you have to tell me, is this hukum ashari or not? But remember everything I said. Specific words like no, idha, innama. I'm going to say them in English because I don't have time at this point. And, uh, and then also if the Prophet gives categories. For example, the Prophet said, the one who gives bribery and takes bribery. Now you made categorize a specific, this is what legal, legal, legalism is about, making specific categories. When you made categories, the one who is giving riba and the taking of riba, now you've made it, what hukam? A shar'i. Okay? Now, it may have a legal precedent or may not have a legal precedent. Okay, so you tell me. There will be, uh, I will start with this. Uh, the Prophet said, this is in Bukhari and Muslim, whoever purposefully throws himself from a mountain and kills himself will be in the hellfire, falling down into it, abiding therein perpetually forever. Whoever drinks poison and kills himself with it, he will carry his poison in his hand and drink for in it in, in the hellfire forever. Whoever kills himself with an iron weapon will be killing himself with an iron weapon forever. Is, this, is there a hukum a shari here? There's a hukum ashari, like for example, if the water got dirty, do this. There's a hukum ashari here. No. There's targhib, targhib, and targhib. There's discouragement. Don't do this. But there is some ulama say that there is a hukum here because it makes many categorizations. It makes what? But the hadith that makes suicide, first of all, it's in the Quran. Do not kill yourselves. But the hadith, if we look at the hadith literature regarding suicide, the most clear one would be a situation where a companion of the Prophet killed himself. So now the Prophet gave a fatwa on that. Okay. In the same way, the Prophet said, He who killed himself with anything in this world will be torment, tormented with, it, with that very on the Day of Judgment. Both cursing the believer and chain, charging him with disbelief is tantamount to killing him. Oh, this is, uh, I've combined two hadiths by mistake, but let's go to the next one, inshallah. Uh, so, the Prophet said, he who killed himself with anything of this world will be tormented with it, with that very thing on the Day of Judgment. Is this a hukam? Or is it targhib or tar tarheeb? Targhib, right? It's no hukam in it. In the same why, way. Why do we have to care if it's a hukum or not? Of course we have to care. No, but is the same as hukum? No, it's Basically not. Basically he's saying don't do it. No. No. See, the general rule is anything the messenger says, ma atakum wa rasulu fa But there is a difference because we are talk, when we make a distinction, or the ulama make a distinction between hukum as shara'i and, and normal taqib and taqib, because when people make judgment, oh, you can't do this because the Prophet said this. We can't do that. You, I mean, because there's certain things that are between Abd and his Allah. And that has to be respected. So where it becomes a legal issue, you take it to the court, you make a big deal out of it. But where it is between Allah and his Abd, you don't need to make a big deal about it. So this is, so for example, uh, this particular place if somebody is suicide, hmm. he killed himself. Okay. Does, is there any precedent for Prophet Sallallahu did his Muaz No. So it means it's, it's punished? No, no. See, there, there are, by the way, about suicide there are uh, two, there's one category of hadith which is the majority of the hadith, which say that there's no janaza for him and he will be tormented. But do we speak ill of him? No. We don't speak ill of him. And just so you know that, uh, you know, the Sheikh Jamal uh, in Moss Foundation, he once did a janazah for a person who did suicide based upon a hadith of the Prophet Again, like I said last time, the general right of a Muslim is a Muslim deserves janazah. 
right? To supersede that with saying no janaza, you have to have a very strong dalil. I'm just giving you the principles. I'm not saying what's right or wrong. But in terms of principles, that is, that is correct. Now, of course, majority of the scholars say, the person who does suicide, you don't pray his. Janaza. Is not praying janaza a hukum, an issue of hukum ashari? My point was. No, no, no. Is not praying janaza a issue of hukum ashari? Yes. Yes, it is a hukum ashari. So that means that some scholars of Islam, they have a hadith that very concretely shows that someone did, did, did suicide and the Prophet did not do his janazah. And then that very concretely shows, okay, we will also not do. Because the right of the believer is to do his janazah. For the Prophet not to have done his janazah shows that there's hukum ashari. But not, see, this is the issue. So that hadith shows us there's a hukum ashari. But this hadith doesn't show us there's hukum ashari. This hadith is telling, is warning us that don't do suicide. So, okay, just go with me for a little bit, inshallah. This is very important. Why is this important? Because, like for example, uh, we mentioned uh, last time uh, the hadith where the Prophet said, get married and get married and get married. But, la darra wa la darra. You don't put people in harm's way. You know, the Prophet do not cause harm. And we talked about when you look at any hadith or any fatwa, the most basic principle is, am I causing harm? You cannot tell a person who is in poverty, get married again and get married again and get married again. This, is, this would be khalif al sharia. This would be against the principles of sharia to do that. So uh, anyway, so just stick with me for a little bit. How much time do I have? Because I have many ahadiths to go through. Huh? Okay, so very quickly, everybody with me. The Messenger of Allah, uh, he said, the Prophet said, Beware of suspicion, for suspicion is most untruthful of speech. Targheeb or hukam. I'm only talking, when I'm talking about this, for example, you mentioned a point that's outside of the point that I brought. So, this hadith, to, uh, be, uh, you could say, uh, being suspicious of others, is there a hukam a shari here? But in Quran, the Quran says, Wala, Wala, don't do this. Wala, tajassasu. So it's hukum ash but does it have a legal precedent? No. You can't take someone to court. He has, he has suspicions over me. Can you? You can't. So somebody has suspicions over you, it, that's between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a hukum in it, but it is going to be decided on the day of judgment. Every hukum is decided on the Day of Judgment, but some of the ahkam, they need to be executed in this life. Some of the ahkam need to be executed in this life. This is why you need to know which one are ahkam and which one are not. You cannot do something about someone who has bad opinion about you. You can't do anything about it. So you can't say to somebody, oh, you know, you don't like me and the Quran says this and this. You can't do anything about it. You just have to forgive them or just let it go. But no, there's no hukum ashari on this, on, on the issue of buhtan and stuff, unless it becomes a legal case. But you cannot, like, if I have bad suspicion about you, you can take me to court. Yes. No, you cannot. Why not? How are you going to prove that? Then? How are you going to prove that I have uh, I've done the the justice on you, or have a su'azan on you? How can you prove it? That's between me and you and Allah on the day of judgment. I cannot. You cannot take me to court for that. You see, hukum ash-shar'i is the one in which you can take me to court. If I'm not praying, you can take me to court. If I steal, you can take me to court. But if I have a bad opinion about you, or I don't say wa alaikum as salam to you, or I'm disrespectful to my parents, so on and so forth, you can't take me to court for that. This becomes important. Why does it become important? All of the hadith literature is important. But it becomes important in understanding what are the priorities of the sharia. What are the what? Which issues you need to make issues for society. And which issues you don't need to make issues for society. 
When they said, uh, in, instead of uh, Assalamu Alaikum properly, they said it improperly, the Prophet said, Wa Alaikum Bas Khalas. You can't do anything about this. It's not a legal issue. Okay. Then, the Prophet Wasallam he says, There are three types of people with whom Allah would neither speak on the Day of Judgment, nor would He look towards them, nor would He purify them, and there would be a severe punishment for them. The old man who does adultery, the ruler who is lying, and the poor person who is full of pride. He's poor, but he's full of arrogance. Is there hukum ashari? No, there's no hukum ashari. Even though it has categories, but you cannot do anything with these categories. Okay, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it is a grievous treachery to tell your brother lies when he believes what you say. Hukum ashari or targhib and tarheeb. It is a grievous treachery that you lie to your brother while he believes in you. Is there hukum ashari here? No. Does it, remember, remember the first 20 hadith we did about tahar. And then there's the Bab al-Salah, and the Bab al-Sawm, and the Bab al-Bayur, and so on and so forth. So, then, the worst sin in the sight of Allah is to bear false witness. There is a hukum ashari here. The worst sin in the sight of Allah is to bear false witness. There's no, there's just a reeb, discouragement or tarheeb. Don't do this. It's the worst sin. It's between you and when Allah, the Prophet says sin, it means the hereafter. When the Prophet says the word sin, it's referring to the hereafter. If the Prophet says halal or haram or some other word that shows it has a hukm in it, then it's about this life. So, because all ahkam are judged in the hereafter, the Prophet has made talheeb and talheeb for everything. But for some things, this is why only out of 100,000 hadiths, only 1,200, 1,500 hadith have ahkam in it. While every hukam, every amal has talheeb and talheeb on the day of judgment, but certain of them have talheeb and talheeb for dunya also. Okay. So, the, there will be some people, no, okay. Let me just continue now very quickly. A, the Prophet said, A servant may utter a word while he is unaware of its consequences. By it, he would be thrown into the hellfire. Targheeb and Targheeb or Hukam ash it's, in, it's in discouragement from doing this. There's no Hukam in it. In the same way, the Prophet says, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسي None of you is a believer until he loves for himself what he loves for his brother. What is this? Even though it starts with la, but what makes if it if the Prophet said, la yuslimu ahadakum? None of you is a Muslim until but he didn't say Muslim. He said la yu'minu ahadakum, meaning your iman is not complete until such and such condition occurs. You cannot give a fatwa on some brother. Oh brother, you don't you don't prefer things for me, and therefore you are not. A believer. No, you can't do that. So, uh, in, in the same way, the Prophet said, uh, None of you is a believer until his desires are suppressed to what I brought. Hukum ash-shar'i. None of you is a believer until his desires are suppressed under what I brought. It would be a hukam, and it. some people may argue, but because of the word mu'min, it's talking about iman. Whereas sharia is not concerned with iman. Sharia is concerned with Islam. So again, this is tarheeb and tarheeb. Okay. Uh, the Prophet said, Allah's curse is on the one who offers the bribe on the judge and the judge who accepts it. This is a hukum because why? There is categories. 
this makes it into hukum. But it's also a curse, so it falls into both categories. Whoever intercedes on, the, on behalf of his brother and therefore offers him a, afterwards offers him a gift, it would be nothing other than riba. If you, if you intercede on someone, please give him a job. And then that brother gives you a gift, that is, accepting that is riba. Is this hadith hukum ash-shar'i or taghib and tarheeb? No, it's hukum ash-shar'i because riba you know is haram. The Prophet is explaining what is riba here. See, the word riba already is defined haram where? In Quran. Over here, the Prophet saying, if you do this, this is riba. For example, another hadith, the Prophet, whoever learns astrology, this is like as if he's doing magic. So the hukum of magic goes on that. Because we know magic is haram, therefore anything like magic would also be, have the same hukum or a similar hukum. That's another uh, thing. Allah curses, uh, Allah curses the man who imitates the woman and the woman who imitates the man. Now if it's somebody, his body language is all feminine, you're going to take him to court? So this is Tarheeb and Tarheeb, right? So, uh, three persons shall not enter paradise. The one who is disobedient to his, paradise, his parents, the one who lets his wife have intimacy with another man, and the woman who imitates a man. Is there a hukum in this? Yes. Because it has categories. And the hukum in it is not effective in the legal sense, but is effective for the... Remember, I talked about this. The hukum is for hukum ash-shari, the one that is effective in dunya, and the one that is between you and Allah and it's effective in the Day of, day of Judgment. So there's a hukum, you, if you, it's a, it's, it's, it is not allowed for a person to do these three things. Now, what is that hukum? Is it fard? Is it haram? Is it sunnah? That's something that needs to be further discussed. But I'm trying to only give you a taste of being able to understand between the hadith of the Prophet that have a hukum in it versus a hadith that had targheeb and tarheeb. This is because one of the big problems today is people just quote Anything to give a fatwa about anything. And the first thing, when you hear a fatwa, the first thing you have to determine is, is this ayah, does this ayah have a hukum in it? Or does this hadith have a hukum in it? You can't just say something is haram or makruh without first defining this has a hukum in it. This is why. Uh, so in, yes? Some hadith does not have hukum. Can I not give a tarheeb to my Muslim brother? No, you can. So I don't understand the reason we are discussing this. The Other reason we can take somebody to court or not. As a common person, why do I need to go to this detail? Because but in, my fear is that we will give less importance to those that is. It's not day. about that. But it look at the other way. way. You're doing more corruption the other way, which is that if you take every hadith to be equal to every other hadith, the ones that have hukum a shari have priority over those that are not. This is why the ulama of the past, they spent much more time on verifying, verifying hadith of ihkam versus the other hadith. But you just said the hukum hadith are only very few, about 1,000. Right. So that's where they spent but most of their time. Fear that we will give less importance to like hundreds and thousands of No, you're completely, it's the opposite way. Okay. The opposite way is that every, you take every single hadith and start quoting it, you'll cause fasad. You take every other single hadith and start quoting it like it's happening today without defining that this has a legal precedent, you'll cause fasad. I don't know where you're coming from, but in general, we don't even quote hadith anymore. That's the problem. No, the people that are quoting it are sometimes quoting them out of context. We're just saying this is our business or you, this is between me and Allah, if I do this and that. But we are See, opposite. No, let me give you an example. Salah, important or not important? Yes. Is there anything more important than salah? Okay, then, the ahad, is it a hukum? Yes, yes. Okay, the hadith that are saying, for example, something, something that's not a, you could say, a clear hukum. There's a guy, he, let's say the Prophet of Allah says, a man who acts like a female and a female who acts like a man, they're cursed. Now, this person doesn't pray. Now, our general attitude as a Muslim community is, we won't even tell him about prayers, we're just going to say, oh, you, you're a man, you're just lost. You act like a female. 
Right? This is what we do. This is why it's important to define these things. Yes, inshallah we will discuss this after you. Allahu